exist. Numinally, I feel that I am, but I cannot find myself. And the same goes for you and for every living being. Why is that? For the same reason that prevents us from seeing our own face. But you can see my face and I can see yours. Nonsense. Perfect nonsense. We see nothing of the kind. What we see when we look at one another and at anything we can see at all, including our own feet, is just our object. And our object is part of ourself as its subject. Nobody else can see us because we have no objective existence whatever. And we cannot see anybody else because they have none. All of us can only see our own objectivizations, whatever they may be. We do not exist as objects? Of course not. No thing exists as an object. That is why there is no such thing as an entity. How could there be? Space and time are purely mental concepts in mind. Where else could an entity extend itself? Then no object is independent? None is dependent either. Others are yourself as whatever you both are and their apparent otherness as your objects is entirely a part of your phenomenal mind. Phenomenal existence or being noumenally is not being. Absolutely, it may be called as it isness. I begin to understand. Of course you do. Is that all it is? As the Tang Dynasty monk said, laughing to his master when he suddenly understood or found himself awake, as they put it. No thing is, in its own right, not even us. No thing. Therefore, there is no us, for we, are only one another's objects as us.
then in what way are we? Just total objective absence. Which is the presence of that I amness? Which is what I amness? Which is this I amness? All of us are that. All of us are not that, not this, not any concept at all. Nothing mysterious about it. Nothing holy. Just phenomenal notness and the absence of the concept of that notness. Then we have no positive being whatever. Positivity and negativity are phenomenal concepts. We are not conceivable at all. Then who lives? You cannot find the doer of any deed, the thinker of any thought, the perceiver of any perception. The unfindable is all that we are. And the unfindable is the found. As Huang Po says, if you still cling to the notion that something, even if it be as small as a hundredth part of a grain, might exist objectively, then even a perfect mastery of the entire Mahayana canon will fail to give you victory over the three worlds. Only when every one of those tiny fragments is seen to be nothing can the Mahayana achieve this victory for you. There is no self and no other there is no wrong desire, no anger, no hatred, no love, no victory, no failure. Only renounce the error of conceptual thought processes and your nature will exhibit its pristine purity. For this alone is the way to attain enlightenment. Shen Hui says, 
only by avoiding intentions will the mind be rid of objects. Only somebody who fancies that they live according to their own good pleasure can have intentions. If they truly knew that as an apparent entity they are being lived, how can they harbour intentions? One who knows that they are being lived must know that as such they cannot be the subject of objects. Since being lived, they are no subject. Objects cannot be their objects. Therefore, to know that one is being lived is to know what one is not. And to know what one is not is to know what one is. Without intentions, we do not have to form concepts, we just act. That alone is transcending conceptualization. Not by suppressing concepts, if we could but by abstaining from volition may we be in conformity with the requirements of the masters. Shen Hui tells us one without a purposeful intention is free from conceptualization. Therefore, it is the volitional activity of mind that is conceptual. Non-volitional activity of mind is free from conceptualization. The I notion alone can have intentions, for ego and will are synonymous. Therefore, absence of the one is also absence of the other. Intentions imply an act of will. The Taoist Wu Wei does not imply phenomenal inaction, but the absence of volitional action. 
the absence of volitional action implies the presence of noumenal action. Which is the Taoist Te, the dynamic aspect of Tao? As Shen Hui says, just by avoiding purposeful intentions, one can be enlightened. The attempt of a lived puppet to lead their own life is essentially the same as that of a dreamed puppet to lead theirs and it is as real as any dream. Moreover, these attempts are the only reality either could ever know. But neither can live, and neither is lived by an entity. Both are puppets reacting to impulses engendered by psychic conditions over which they have no control. Neither is sentient objectively, neither is an entity. The apparent sentiency of both is a reflex of the mind which is all that they are. The I notion, which has intention is itself such a reflex. Its performance as inaugurator of pretended acts of volition is a fantasy. And it is precisely this fantasy which constitutes suffering. In the absence of the fantasy of dreaming, there is the bliss of deep sleep. And in the absence of the fantasy of living, there is the bliss of nirvana, or awakened life. Intention is the temporal cause of psychological conflict and purposeful intention is the temporal cause of physical conflict. Intemporally, there is no intention and without intention, there is no counterpart to bliss. The term bliss being a conventional indication of the state of unconditioned being, which is devoid of any element of objectivity. Volition, therefore, is a psychic chain which holds a phenomenal individual in apparent bondage. For volition is the pseudo-subject attempting to act independently of the force of circumstances. 
the absurdity of this performance should be sufficiently evident. teaching of the masters of all the schools of liberation, not only Buddhic, Vedantic and Taoist, but Semitic also, as witness, not my will but thine, O Lord, consists in attempts by means of knowledge practices and manoeuvres to free the pseudo-individual from the chains of volition. For when that is abandoned, no bondage remains. Purest doctrines, such as those of Ramana Maharshi, Padmasambhava, Huang Po, and Shen Hui, just teach us that it is sufficient by analysis utterly to comprehend that there is no entity that could have effective volition. that an apparent act of volition, when in accord with the inevitable, can only be a vain gesture, and when in disaccord, the fluttering of a caged bird against the bars of his cage. When he knows that, then at last he has peace and is glad. At a fair when I was young, one could pretend to drive little motor cars round and round a track. They had a steering wheel that reacted to springs. But the vehicle was driven and steered automatically from below. Since one instinctively turned the wheel in the direction the little car had to go, it was difficult not to believe that one was steering it. And even more difficult to stop trying to steer it and leave it to take one where it would. For that might have been disaster. Such exactly is our volitional way of living. Non-volitional living is glad living. Being lived as a non-entity is subjective living, in which suffering is no longer such, 
in which there is no place for care and for worry, in which everything is as it is and as it must be. For it is intention that is responsible for dualistic conception and the ensuing comparison of interdependent counterparts seen as opposites, one of which is good and the other bad. Also, it is noumenal living and all that noumenal living is. It could also be termed reintegration. Presence in the now moment is eternal. It is intemporal. Phenomenally, we cannot know it. Being present in the present is phenomenally non-volitional living, but noumenally is finding ourselves in the intemporality of awakened being, which is our eternal heritage. Tao, the pathless way, has a gateless gate, which, just as the equator separates the northern from the southern hemisphere, illusorily separates and unites the phenomenal and the noumenal, samsara and nirvana. It is the open road of escape from solitary confinement in the dungeon of individuality. It is the way of reintegration in this which we are, and it is pure as it isness.